Good morning and good afternoon, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to all our attendees. Welcome to this grouping call webinar. Our title for today is Access Management and Federation for the Agile Connected Enterprise. The speakers today are me, Martin Kuppinger. I'm founder and principal analyst at Kuppinger Call, and Jason Macy, who's CTO of Forum Systems. Forum Systems is supporting this webinar. Before we uh, fully start, um, some information about Kuppinger Call, um, some housekeeping information for the webinar, and a quick look at the agenda. So, Kuppinger Call, we are an company providing enterprise IT research, advisory services, decision support, and networking for IT professionals, particularly in the field of information security, through our research services, our advisory services, and our events. Our main event is the upcoming European Identity and Cloud Conference, which will be held next time, May 5th to 8th in Munich. It's a must-attend conference when you're interested in information security, identity access, cloud, digital risk, and related topics. Regarding the webinar, um, you are muted centrally, so you don't have to mute or unmute yourself. We are controlling these features. We will record the webinar, and the podcast recording will be available latest by tomorrow. The Q&A session will be at the end, but you can enter questions at any time. Using the questions feature, you will find in the GoToWebinar control panel, which is usually at the right side of your screen. So, my proposal always is, um, so if once a question comes to your mind, enter this question, and then we will end up with a uh, long list of questions for the Q&A session, which makes this even more interesting then. So, let's have a look at the agenda. The agenda for today is, um, I will do the first part of the presentation and talk about challenges of today's and future's access to systems, to information, so connecting people, apps, things, and more, more the high-level overview on these aspects. Um, and the second part, then, uh, Jason Macy of Forum Systems will dive deeper into detail and talk about requirements, standards, technical components for future access management and federation solutions for everyone and everything based on gateway approaches and illustrated by case studies and customer-based best practices. In the third part, finally, we will do the Q&A session I've already talked about, so if there are any questions, send me these questions and we will pick them during Q&A. I will start with a slide, the one other of you might have seen before, um, our computing troika slide, which is still massively affecting the changes we are observing in IT where we have the cloud computing, social computing, and mobile computing as the um, overarching trends. Cloud computing was different types of deployment models, so we have more applications in the cloud, um, or services we need to access. We have different types of user populations, and that's what I fit under the term of social computing. So our external users, our business partners, our customers, etc., we have to integrate, and we have far more types of devices, so we have an ever-increasing number of devices, a permanent change in that area with um, new types of devices appearing on the market, um, other types of devices uh, becoming less relevant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in this um, changing environment, information security also has to change, so we have to support more deployment models, more user populations, more device types to protect our information, and the information, in fact, is at the center of this, and regardless where information is, regardless who accesses it, regardless which device is used, we need to protect our information. That means access and federation, the two major topics for today, play a major role here. And to look at this from a little bit different angle, but um, also quite um, related to the slide I've shown, I've shown before, um, what we really see in these days is everything becomes connected. So we have in the center of this, um, of this graph, we have the people, and these people, they are part of organizations and they act on behalf of organizations. They own devices, they use devices, they own and utilize things. Devices and things communicate. Um, 
there are things which are even devices because they are used by humans and they are things because they act autonomous, such as smart watches where we already see a number in the market. Um, and we have, on the other hand, then little devices which are owned by organizations and so on. And all these things are communicating and these are and things and the humans are communicating, the organizations are related to this. The entire relationship becomes more complex. We have to deal with the apps which are running on devices, um, the software which runs on the things which might be something like a singlet or whatever we call it in the future. And we have the classical back-end systems in the organization. Um, so what really comes into play here as well is that we are not only talking about sort of human-centric communication like we did traditionally, where a human um, uses his computer to do something, to access a service, to access a website, whatever, but we have an increasing number of situations where an API is used and apps or the software and things, let's call them singlets, or the services at the back end, whether in the cloud or not, are communicating through APIs. And they are, in many cases, acting on behalf of a particular person. So we need to understand the identity context of the human uh, behind the app. We need to understand the identity of the app itself, of the thing, etc. So a thing might belong to multiple persons. A device might be used by multiple persons. Um, but it might be also related to a single person, the current user, which makes this entire picture of identities and their access even more complicated because it's not a sort of a one one relation anymore. A person accesses a service, but it's a multi-step relation where a thing communicates on behalf of a person, um, where an app is used on a device which is owned by one person but is used by a different person, whatever. So things are increasingly complex and we need to handle the challenges of access and federation in this environment. And to add another picture, um, we are talking about far more, and I even have, have the things in here, far more identities than ever before. So employee is something we, we have looked at when we look at identity and access, we have looked at for many years. Um, Business partners, some are in for quite a long time, others are coming in here with more onboarding, new business models, new types of sales channels, etc. But those are sort of relatively small numbers compared to the numbers of prospects, leads, customers. So, so one of our um, advisory customers, they have 20, 27,000 employees and they have 4 to 3 million customers. And when we call count the number of things, we are talking about tens of millions in that particular organization. So we will see even more of that explosion over the next years and there are a lot of predictions around the number of things, but all of them are in the billions of things. Managing identities, managing access will become an even more interesting challenge than it has been uh, until now. So overall businesses are changing and this is sort of the new ABC, we have these agile businesses that are connected. There are so many different terms, so in Germany we find the term of industry for the, though, for the first industrial revolution. Um, in other countries we find the um, digital transformation of businesses and so on. In fact, it's really about the point that we have this A, agile, B, business, C, connected, which really makes up this entire transformation. So businesses have to be agile. Um, this is a must in a changing competitive landscape in an area where we see a lot of information, where we really see this digital transformation of uh, formerly very well, sort of physical uh, to services to more um, IT services in the broader sense. So if you look at a simple example such as the connected vehicle, so it's not only providing the good, the vehicle, but it's also providing services. And in some areas, the service becomes even more important than the physical good. So we have this need for agility and we have, as so, an um, inevitable consequence, 
this aspect of connection. Things become connected, we have to deal with it. So what does we call it? Uh, open enterprise connected, enterprise extended, enterprise doesn't really matter, but we have a lot of change. We have new business models, new business processes, and changing business processes, different communication channels, uh, changes in the organization, the IT applications and apps we've never had before, and so on. And we connect business partners, customers, leads, prospects, information sources, social networks, things, whatever you can imagine. And this is really where we have to, to rethink the way we are doing access, where we, we are doing federation. So um, we see a lot of, and this is still without looking at the things, which add another level of complexity. But even when we look at sort of the down-to-earth aspects of um, how businesses are communicating with others, other parties such as their business partners, their consumers, etc., then there are some very obvious um, demands we are facing in virtually any organization. It's the use of cloud services, just the request of your business to use cloud services. It's about accessing business partner systems uh, with um, an ever-tightening um, supply chain and collaboration between business partners and collaborate in industry networks. And many industry, which are particularly ones which are um, research intensive, such as um, healthcare, such as um, yeah, and a lot of others look at aerospace and defense and so on. Um, then we have a lot of collaboration in these networks. We have the need for enabling the mobile workforce, so people want to use their mobile devices. And we have the need for onboarding business partners, different sales channels, etc. We need to handle customer interaction, which means we also need to provide an adequate supply, which is federation, which is new types of directories, sometimes also identity management move to the cloud, particularly for the external parties. Versatile authentication, a topic I will touch on my next slide. Um, risk and context-based access management and authentication, or the entire adaptiveness, so taking context into account, um, becoming more flexible because it's not someone is using his PC in the internal uh, corporate network. And so everything is fine, but it's far more complex scenario where the same person accessing the same system and information in some cases might cause more and others less risk. So if he's using an unsecure device, using an uh, unsecure uh, wireless network somewhere in the world, it's a different story than when he works from the corporate network. And we need to do this because this is really the, um, supplying to this demand is really what drives business value. So agility, as I've said, organizations need to be agile. Compliance, protecting information anyway in an, when we open up the entire environment. And security clearly also has a part. Innovation, being able to, 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 to work with business partners on innovation, for instance, collaboration, communication, new forms of collaboration, mobile workers, mobile workforce, etc. So this is really the changing um, landscape we are in. And this has to do a lot with access and uh, with identity. So at the end, it's about how can we protect information, how can we uh, mitigate risks, um, a lot of this entire story is really of, are we able to manage all these identities of all the related parties and the things in future and to control the access to keep these things under control? This is really the big story we are looking at. And when we look at the future of authentication and authorization, which also means where, where access and, and uh, access management and federation are heading, then we see some change, so we have to service providers. This could be an internal application, it can be something in the cloud. We need to authenticate and we need to authorize. And then as of now, it's mainly authenticating people. In the future, it will be uh, increasingly, it's more authenticating apps in the context of users. And the things will come in, et cetera. We need, anyway, to authenticate, to authorize, to define who's allowed to do what, or what is allowed to do what in the future. And there are policies which control that. There's the context, so which device is someone using? The directories where we have the information about the users, the identity providers which might deliver additional attributes, and the credentials in use. So which credential can be used by a particular type of device? And we have to change this, make more runtime decisions 
um, not only static access control, become more adaptive, become more flexible, more agile to support our agile organizations. Which in fact means we need versatility or, or adaptiveness regarding the credentials, supporting different types of authentication mechanisms for different use cases. We need to become dynamic, so we, we can't just rely on <coughs> someone is authenticating, then he's good, but it depends on the context, it depends on a number of factors, and all this happens in the context of risk. So we need to understand the risk, which is caused by a particular authentication and authorization request to really fulfill the business requirements we are facing in our organization. So this is where things are really moving, and I think we've, we've for at least for a very long time, we've we haven't seen such a big uh, change request or change for, for the entire things we're doing around identities and access. We have more identities, we have different types of access, we have a far more complex environment to deal with, and we need to find answers which help us to move forward step by step, so not a big bang um, solution where we throw out all the old stuff or where we build up a uh, a, a, a separate infrastructure. We have to enable our infrastructure to cover better the sort of the today's use cases, more types of business partners, external access cloud, whatever, more federation and so on, plus the, all the things which are popping up, apps, things and so on. So this is my introduction to this topic and right now I want to hand over to um, Jason who will then talk about requirements, standards, technical components for future access management and federation solutions for everyone and everything based on gateway approaches and illustrated by case studies and customer best practices. So Jason, I will make you the presenter now. It's your turn. Thank you, Martin. So yes, uh, my name is Jason Macy. I'm the Chief Technical Officer with Forum Systems and I am going to build off uh, some of the concepts that Martin has put forth with regard to uh, effectively recognizing and realizing the need for agility and how we really accomplish this this next phase of identity integration, access management, and federation in in the modern enterprise. Forum Systems has been around for uh, a number of years. We actually uh, were established back in 2001, and our core focus is on delivering the API security gateway called Forum Sentry. It is the foundation of which we've built a secure architecture product that abstracts the concepts of security, identity access control, data mediation, and single sign-on in a technology component that is built for agility in order to combine many of these things as we'll talk about today to accomplish these concepts of federation and, and integration and collaboration um, of disparate technologies. Um, and this is the foundation, really, of coupling security concepts with identity and access control and federation so that we can reduce risk posture while still recognizing uh, business agility and integration capabilities um, using technology that's, that's designed to accomplish that. The goal of our identity federation uh, is effectively to normalize to the best degree possible the identity formats, to, to maximize interoperability and to simplify this, the, the notion of connecting and enabling all of these different uh, points of, of communication from um, the various uh, devices, things, and people. Uh, and, and ultimately, the notion of federation, of course, is the seamlessness of the experience, whereby credentials and information exchange can be done and accomplished in a secure way uh, with, a, with an experience of, of the, uh, of, from the user's perspective of being seamless um, with regard to that actual user experience. And so we're going to talk about some of the foundational technologies that, that go into this. Uh, and, and focus also on, from an SSO perspective, the most common two that are uh, prevalent in the industry, which are uh, SAML and, and OAuth. So I, I want to build off from the slide that Martin built up to in his presentation around the achieving access management and federation through uh, a, a more versatile and dynamic means by which to 
authenticate, authorize, and control access uh, by way of uh, effectively combining many of these different aspects that go into um, the achievement of federation and access management with, with a risk posture as, as the core security concept uh, in that uh, notion of business enablement. So with that, what I want to do is effectively focus on what it takes to accomplish this concept of you know, d dynamic runtime decision making. So if we take the requirements, uh, I want to break them down uh, into really four primary components. The authentication component, the role access control component, the content, the information that's actually being exchanged that pertains to these users' devices and things. And finally, the federation concepts and single sign-on concepts of unifying an, an, an ecosystem where the identity and, and information can be shared and delegated and, and achieve a sort of a unified uh, experience, a seamless experience. So we're going to take each of these uh, and break them down into the technology concepts and, and that go into it. We'll start with authentication. So one of the things that has evolved over the landscape of computing in the last 10 years is that there are at least a framework of standards that have evolved with regard to identity formats. Now, it's still quite broad in nature, but at least it's based and founded in uh, a set of uh, fairly well-known token variants. Now this can be within SOAP messages, within XML messages, within REST patterns uh, on HTTP protocols or JMS protocols, but ultimately it is framed to a large degree in a set of sort of known context, whereby that user token information uh, with uh, the ability to go across all of those variants and be able to extract the relevant information that identifies uh, the system, the device, or the user uh, that's uh, effectively being uh, uh, requesting that access or that communication channel, if we can unify the ability to uh, extract those credentials, then what we want to do is we want to couple that with the appropriate uh, infrastructure systems where that are the uh, policy holders of record for those users. Uh, this could be LDAP, Active Directory, many of the IBM systems out there like SiteMinder, Tivoli Access Manager, Kerberos, database systems, some repository generally that has been built up over time that identifies which users are allowed uh, and and what uh, their credentials are and, and, and the validity capabilities of, of taking those user credentials out of those formats on the left and uh, identifying them as valid and 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 um, and and legitimate uh, based on uh, IBM system infrastructure databases uh, LDAP directory systems on the right. What that gives us is a user, uh, effectively, or a context uh, of, of, of a user concept. This may not always be a physical user. It could be a B2B system. Uh, could be a, a, a thing or a device. But it identifies a characteristic that we'll, we'll call an authentication token or a user. Um, as our first step, that's our first necessity, is to know who it is or what it is that's attempting to make this con connection, attempting to make this request. And if we can unify that across those, those token formats, we can, we can consolidate that effort and call it authentication. Rather than worrying about the diversity and complexities of the varying technologies out there, if we frame it in terms of the standards, we can now unify all those technologies by way of leveraging those formats and extracting the credentials from those formats. Once we've accomplished that, we've now got a user that's identified, which is attempting to make a request to obtain some information across some API or information border, effectively going into an infrastructure to retrieve you know, some information from an app or a portal or a, a service or, or, or a database, uh, things of that nature, where there's some kind of information exchange uh, being presented for requests. And now, now that we've identified the user, what we want to do is correlate that further by way of figuring out what, what, what that user 
has rights and responsibilities, roles, uh, what groups and memberships that user belongs to, permissions from that user. And this often requires going into the environment where some of that information needs to be uh, looked up and, 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 and aggregated. It could be in databases, it could be in, uh, in repositories that, that aggregate user rights and, and, and information. We talked about LDAP, Active Directory, that's often coupled with other systems that has uh, additional criterion. But ultimately, bring those together, if we can take that user that we've now ex extracted across those relevant token formats and, and, and couple that with the ability to integrate with systems that identify additional characteristics about that user, now we can make more intelligent role-based decisions about where that user is allowed to go, what that user is allowed to do based on the user itself. So that's where role-based access control, or RBAC, comes into our, our next piece of the puzzle uh, on taking that identified user and determining and assessing the roles affiliated with that identified user. And that allows us and enables some concepts of, of enablement of those communication flows. But that isn't enough. We've got to go further than that. And so the next phase in an analysis of this communication exchange and, 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 and business integration is also looking in, at the content. So here's where it's essential from a dynamic uh, collaboration and integration perspective not only to rely on a trusted user and, and, and roles based on the user, but it's also the content and information flow that, f that, that, that feeds uh, uh, from that user. As, as Martin uh, pointed out, uh, in, in his presentation, the user is often you know, a, a, a component that's coming in through either you know, uh, you know, cars, infrastructure, you know, so devices, uh, mobile phones. Um, so the user is a part of it, but there's also the information that's coming in and out of that uh, information border in the API that we want to couple with the roles and, and identification. And, and also use the content and information flows that are going back and forth. Now, these also, fortunately, in the modern era, have evolved to be um, reasonably structured and standards-based to improve interoperability and to enhance integration. And so a lot of this has evolved to a, a framework of standards that are uh, normally based upon the kind of technology on the infrastructure side as well as on the client side, so you'll see you know, REST, XML, and JSON primarily in mobile app data exchange. And you'll see in web browsers the similar kinds of concepts. Mobile apps and, and browser technologies are actually quite similar in the actual information formats that they exchange. And B2B infrastructures are structured effectively uh, around SOA, SOAP, XML, JSON, um, where we can uh, take and, and, and if we can analyze that information exchange, what we can do in addition to the trusted user and the roles and responsibilities is take a look at the information exchange across those API boundaries, at those connection points of, of, of integration and information exchange, and hone in on the specific characteristics of those message exchanges in order to have a more versatile means of, of, of not just relying purely on uh, a trusted user and roles and responsibilities, but have a more granular means of tying that to the expected communication patterns that you want those users to, to have. And what this provides is a deeper context of, of access control, but a more dynamic means of doing it by the user, based on the user rather than a static sort of universal user gets in and gets everything, this is a more dynamic way of coupling all of these concepts together, not only relying on a user and, and, and authentication, but relying on the payload. Very similar to airport security. If I'm going through airport security, uh, my identification is checked, and, 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 and of course I'm identified by having a, a ticket to, to board a plane. But my, my bags are checked as well. The, 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 uh, the, the context of, of the user needs to be coupled with the information that that user is bringing with them in and, and extracting out. And so that's where content-based access control is another part of this dynamic um, enablement where we're connecting by way of uh, assurance of the information exchange where we can allow or deny information flows so that we reduce the risk posture 
but we still maintain that business agility and that data enablement and integration enablement at a more granular context by focusing also on the payload, on the information exchange that's being, uh, that's, that's being put forth to, to communicate. So those three things then lead to the ability or necessity or desire to federate such that these varying types of identity formats that we talked about earlier that fold into some credential, some trusted credential. Once we've established a trusted credential, then we can federate that credential, which is the means to sort of delegate that that particular user has been authenticated through some trusted means and other systems through trust enablement, which we'll talk about in a moment how we accomplish that, can then allow this user with that one set of credentials to gain access to many different types of infrastructure, uh, many different types of ecosystems where the seamlessness of the user experience after that initial login is abstracted from its ability to access these other types of uh, infrastructure technologies uh, through the means of federation. And so the, the whole concept here uh, brings together all those earlier uh, concepts in terms of what data formats and information flow, but ultimately gives the seamlessness of that initial authentication that carries with it characteristics of the roles, characteristics of the user where the content is obviously different across these different variants and, and, and those access control provisions are still applying. But we have a single credential that we can utilize and build a trust model whereby that then uh, can be a much more uh, seamless ecosystem of communication without uh, suffering from any uh, degradation of, of risk or, or ability to uh, identify um, the user and enable the roles and responsibilities that those users are, are allowed to have within each of these different kinds of um, service endpoint environments. The two primary means by which to accomplish that are SAML and OAuth. And for good reason. The SAML uh, assertion, uh, security assertion markup language standard was uh, developed and is, is, is effective effectively a means to uh, provide authentication, authorization, and attribute information about a user that has been authenticated using some trusted means such that we can then delegate that authentication to uh, what we call a relying party or some other component infrastructure environment where we, we've built a trust model using uh, PKA, PKI and DSIG, in other words digital signatures and PKI, where we establish a trust that suggests if we as the source of authentication and authorization have uh, accurately and, 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 and adequately authenticated and identified the user, what we're then going to do is delegate that authorization so that other uh, infrastructure and other systems can uh, leverage that without having to have all the infrastructure to call into an Active Directory and IDM systems and all those other things don't exist oftentimes. If you're going out into the cloud or you're going to a, a trading partner, they're not going to be able to access all the characteristics of the user. So we use things like SAML and OAuth to provide information about that user uh, and extend that authentication boundary using the concepts of delegated authentication where we're uh, providing then and, and, and building off from that initial credential a means to carry forward a, 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 an assertion uh, token, if you will, which is a, a set of information about that user. Uh, and this is SAML in and of itself is quite robust and versatile. It, it, it's built off the concept of being able to be used in, in SOA concepts and, and, and XML and SOAP as well as uh, HTTP and, and HTML such that it's, it's quite versatile in nature uh, in terms of being able to uh, sort of provide that framework to, uh, to, to pass forward credentials to, to all those different kinds of environments. Similarly, uh, OAuth has, uh, has gained in adoption quite significantly over the past few years, primarily driven out of uh, mobile technologies uh, and uh, social media where there's been very broad adoption for this notion called open authentication. 
Uh, and again, this is a, a delegated authentication mechanism where we first establish some strong authentication mechanism where we've identified a user and then util utilizing uh, SSO OAuth tokens or a, a means by which to delegate then that that, that particular user has been authenticated and, and here are you know various criteria about that user and roles and, and, and capabilities that can then be provided uh, through a trust model in a delegated way. So both of these have, have pros and cons, but ultimately the, um, the, these are the two primary means of achieving um, single sign-on and federation out there in the industry through, um, through utilizing these, these two uh, standards that can unify those concepts of a single authentication that can be extended to uh, to, to, you know, to the cloud and to the to trading partners to different ecosystems, um, whereby that we we can recognize going back to this uh, to this picture, we can recognize that once we've established that credential, we can then build that trust model of uh, integration, uh, collaboration, uh, without making the user log in in different environments in different places uh, over and over again. So the seamlessness of the user experience, uh, coupled with the uh, business agility of, of integration with different uh, with different systems is the goal of federation uh, founded uh, within the principles of, of these standards. And so taking all those concepts together, uh, this feeds into the foundation of achieving access management and federation by bringing all of these capabilities into an a single technology component that can abstract these functions from the actual data and services being accessed. The key concept around achieving this type of thing is by way of abstracting through architecture design, what we can do is we can recognize the agility through boundary protection mechanisms whereby that particular necessity to in, uh, consume different services across different disparate uh, data formats and, and different environments, uh, you know, from web portals to, to, to ESB systems to web services to mobile apps, and the disparity of clients and all those different formats of data information, all those formats of identity tokens, uh, unifying the ability to consume and authenticate, provide role-based access control functionality, at a uniform centralized location in the communication pattern, identifying and inspecting content to couple with and make more intelligent uh, contextual decisions about user and data enablement, all then wrapped up in the ability to federate and to uh, enable uh, that, those credential capabilities and access control and content capabilities and unify that in a means that enable then the federation uh, and, and single sign-on capabilities. So abstracting all this out, the concepts of, uh, of, of what you know, we as a company provide in the API Security Gateway is really focused on this concept of enablement of access management and federation for the enterprise by way of consolidated uh, technology that can unify those disparities of different clients and, 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 and and, and uh, different uh, client-side uh, integration points and different service uh, points of communication. Uh, because if you consider the complexity of all of that, of course, uh, as Martin said, it can, can be in, in the billions of, 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 of different areas of complexity. But fortunately, framed still in relevant uh, characteristics when it comes to the actual token formats and information formats that are being exchanged, those are actually framed in a more reasonable boundary where gateway technology is designed to broker uh, specifically those uh, variants and enable the access management and federation of those capabilities. So I'm going to actually showcase it as an example where um, this is uh, we've we've done this uh, in the industry and you know we've done it over and over again in many 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 different places. But I figured I'd use this one uh, in the interest of time as a as a deployment reference in terms of what we've done to accomplish this using these principles of federation and, and access control. Uh, so in the United States, uh, a project was launched back in about 2005-2006 that has evolved over, over the years uh, till today 
called MEF Modernization and E-File. This was the largest software project ever developed in the United States, and it was effectively taking a uh, paper-based filing uh, system for U.S. Uh, tax returns to electronic tax filings and enablement of an electronic ecosystem of tax filing uh, for all businesses and, and personal filings in the United States. And this really brought to bear many of the concepts that we've discussed up to this point uh, that, that has uh, required uh, an interoperable capability that can unify you know, thousands of different kinds of client technologies uh, coupled with the necessity to do identification, uh, in this case two-factor identification, so we have a very uh, necessary means of, uh, of accurately identifying you know, wh who is trying to communicate into the um, U.S. Treasury infrastructure. Um, looking and inspecting information, so the content access control and content analytics that go into the data exchange, um, the need to provide a, a more seamless experience for the bigger um, uh, organizations here in the United States that actually are aggregating file entities like uh, Intuit, H&R Block, uh, PricewaterCooper are the big ones in the U.S. that are actually a, um, a sort of staging area for, for tax returns and they deliver end, end consumer products. So in order for those organizations to deliver more seamless uh, capabilities into the uh, e-file infrastructure, uh, we needed to build, uh, they needed to have a, a single sign-on capability. And all this is, the founding principle of all of this is these capabilities are built into a secure uh, technology component that is itself as uh, accreditations and in, 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 uh, can't be compromised. And so conceptually it looks like this. Uh, the, the, the Sentry Gateway as an API gateway provides those capabilities of, 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 of integrated federation across many different infrastructure uh, services uh, presenting a, a, an integration point to, to the outside uh, clients, uh, the big ones as well as the, the several thousand of the individual ones, whereby uh, we're providing all the capabilities around single sign-on, single assertion validation, data validation, um, and effectively unifying that presentation of uh, tax uh, uh, processing infrastructure, but enabling that through more modern uh, technologies whereby the infrastructure itself doesn't need to have any of the concepts of uh, SAML assertion and single sign-on and, and, uh, and, con and, and, and effectively um, uh, identity uh, uh, token variants. That's all abstracted uh, through uh, architecture design at the gateway layer such that it can be more agile about in, in, on-ramping new types of clients and new uh, types of infrastructures without uh, coupling that directly to the services. And this builds back on those premises of those four uh, you know, primary um, uh, requirements that uh, were necessary to achieve this, this next phase of sort of uh, federation authentication access control and unifying that at, at a technology layer in, in the network. Um, so thank you for that, and I will uh, turn it now um, back over uh, to Martin. Thank you, Jason. And um, so let's directly continue with the um, Q&A. We already have some questions here. And if you have additional questions, don't hesitate to enter them now so that we can pick them and answer them. So, um, I think the same question from two different people, so um, obviously one we should pick first. Um, the question is, are we not forgetting OpenID Connect aside of SAML and OS? OpenID Connect is absolutely another uh, consideration. Uh, OpenID Connect and, and OAuth can, can actually be sort of are, are I think are converging in the industry, but absolutely that is another uh, another up and coming uh, adopted um, capability. Though I, I I still see that as uh, as a, as a third uh, tier option to in terms of adoption, because if you think about the major social media outlets such as Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Salesforce, all of those. Um, uh, integration points have have out of the box OAuth and SAML connectors, and so those are are well established uh, 
capabilities that infrastructure uh, vendors have already built into their stacks. And so ultimately that uh, it lends itself often when, when actually performing the integrations to, to choose those technologies since it's, uh, it, it provides a, a broader versatility of, of existing um, technologies and integration points that have already uh, adopted those as, as sort of uh, existing uh, capabilities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when we're already talking about standards, um, what are your expectations regarding the upcoming UMA or UMA standard? So user managed access, which also fits into this bigger OWASP and OpenID Connect uh, picture. Well, uh, this is uh, uh, an affirmation of the of the of the dynamic nature of of of, of business agility, and, and all of these um, all these things continue to evolve. It's it's an it's an important aspect, really, of what our concepts are stepping back in terms of, of gateway technology itself. The concept of gateway technology is the ability to abstract um, the decision points of, of integration and, and, and user authentication and, and access control decision making in ways that can uh, be more agile with not only existing business landscape, but the evolutionary nature of computing and uh, and, 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 and standard adoption so that we get away from the notion of tightly coupling systems together where uh, being more agile and adopting of, of, of new innovative standards uh, becomes more difficult because we have too many interconnecting points of, of legacy and modern systems. So really the concept of, of, of UMA as well as other emerging standards is that um, through architecture design of gateway technology, you get the advantages of, 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 of an abstracted layer whereby those innovative characteristics can, can, can evolve and independent of sort of direct infrastructure which can take advantage of that. And that's kind of how we look at this. We're always looking at emerging standards and looking at emerging capabilities and this is always an ever evolving uh, landscape. Um, so that's really where we, we focus on um, the concepts of, of, of architecture design and abstraction to achieve that agility in those things that not only apply today, but will apply in the, in, in the evolving landscape of computing. Okay, perfect. Um, so APIs, um, there's a uh, sort of pretty short question. Um, the question, in fact, says API available to public. Um, this question came up when you uh, talked about the APIs. Um, so, I'm not sure whether the context is more APIs your system provides or APIs uh, managed by your system. So APIs is a very interesting uh, terminology that has evolved over the over the years, but ultimately the API represents a communication point of data enablement, of, of enabling uh, a, a, a communication channel to some service or data. And that API public facing uh, could be uh, a different uh, nature of API than the exact same service or exact same data consumed by uh, internal employees or uh, trusted uh, business partner environments. So think about an API as a level of abstraction that enables you to uh, apply more or less uh, identity access control and security in order to sort of at that border, at that, at that API layer, uh, enable or not enable that communication pattern to the service. And so by doing that, you know, public APIs or private APIs uh, are, are conceptually based upon what kinds of levels of, of security and, and identity access control you want to layer upon it in order to enable that communication pattern. Uh, and, and obviously that's a, a different depending on the nature of data. If you're talking about public kind of information like weather or things of that nature, it might be different than uh, exposing you know, more sensitive information like you know, online banking information or things of that nature. So APIs, whether public facing or private facing, are that exact concept of being able to abstract the um, the, the risk posture and identification from the service, so the service can do what the service does, but enabling access to that through the API is, is what you can achieve, where you can achieve that, that agility and, and, and broader spectrum of integration. 
So, so we have um, so some more, more background on this question. So it, it's also about the API provided uh, by EU products. So um, are they available to public? Um, is there support for the API in common development environments? So and, and, and what, what, what does it need if you want to build an app uh, to use the product? So how much do you need to reflect your sort of the, the form system APIs? Cetera. Maybe you can dive a little bit deeper into that. I can, I, I can speak to that directly. The Forum Systems API is basically can be a, a, a direct mirror of what exactly the intended API was. So the, the concept is the Forum Sentry is a, is a virtual API infrastructure, meaning that it's meant to present an API to a consumer in the exact manner uh, that the, the service itself was meant to be communicated. So the, the, the nature of a gateway is seamless. A client doesn't know a gateway even exists. Uh, and neither does the service for that matter because it's a broker of information exchange. It presents the virtual API to the consumer uh, in, in, in the manner in which your service wants to present it. So you want a REST API, mobile API, web portal API, SOA API, uh, HTML API, any of those variants are just point-and-click policy enablement. So those API creation points are based upon the kind of service that you're exposing communication to. But the gateway itself is an intermediary. It's, it's to a client. It's, it, it's, it's presenting itself as the virtual service, and it's brokering on behalf of the client, so the service still thinks it's talking to the client. So in, in both cases, it's actually meant to be a, a seamless intermediary that gives you that, 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 that centralized location to uh, to extend those APIs, so things like if I have a SOAP service and I want to build a mobile app, I can go to the gateway and expose a REST API and a SOAP API for that service. So those are the, the other aspects that conceptually the abstraction layer of the gateway give you a much broader flexibility of enabling and, 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 and adding APIs uh, to system infrastructure that may otherwise have never been able to expose their data uh, and services in that manner. Okay, uh, there's another question. I'm, I think I will answer that for, or provide my answer first, then you can uh, add to this or, or tier, tier my answer <laughs> in parts, whatever. Um, so if all major players use OpenID Connect for interconnecting web apps, is that not a sign that SAML is out of date? So my view on that is SAML is, is clearly something which is, is moving more towards, I would say, a legacy state. Uh, however, there are a number of use cases, particularly if you look up business-to-business uh, -business communication uh, where it's more, uh, for, for the scenarios where it's more one-to-one uh, -one, uh, scenario federating um, parties, then SAML still has a very important role and SAML will continue to be important because, for instance, also if you look at authentication to cloud services, then SAML is currently the de facto standard. So SAML, uh, so OpenID, uh, connect and, and OWASP uh, together are clearly gaining crown, but SAML will is here to stay and it's probably here to stay for a very very long time with another option right now or other options for for different use cases. It basically depends on the use case. Um, others are winning crown, but SAML is here to stay. That's my view on it, Jason. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think what we're seeing is an emergence of an extension to OAuth, which is uh, effectively bringing the some of the concepts of SAML closer to OAuth, where SAML gives those um, uh, uh, the ability of that strong authentication, the PKI component, the data security component of digital signature trust with PKI, and effectively what we're seeing is sort of a convergence, and the idea is you want more flexible, open capabilities, but you also need to sort of wrap that up in an additional security layer of, uh, of uh, you know, reduction of, uh, of, of, the, of threat vectors and capabilities of, you know, sort of, um, you know, uh, of, you know, not being able to protect tokens where OpenID is sort of coming coming into that and trying to really uh, take OAuth and sort of move it in that direction of a little more wrapped up uh, security and more of the concepts of what really SAML gives you, which is uh, a digital signed uh, uh, capability through strong PKI trust, public-private key infrastructure trust, um, that is a, a, a strong foundation of of the trust model. Um, but uh, yeah, so all these things that are evolving over time uh, stick around for a long time, and as uh, as Martin said, you know, in particular uh, in so environments and legacy environments, uh, SAML is absolutely you know a foundational standard. 
but the web SSO profile and the ability to embed SS, uh, SAML within base64 through simple HTTP redirects has also given it a lot of adoption capability also in the mobile and, 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 and portal and cloud world. Um, but, but certainly there's lots of space for, for um, these, these standards to, to accomplish the goal of secure delegated authentication. Okay, and well, there's one final question I think here, which is more targeted to me. So it's about how to access the related research um, displayed. Um, there are various options. So you can, for a time limited period, time limited period, uh, access some parts of our research using the select access, which you will find uh, directly on, on at the, I think, right top uh, of our website. And there are various types of uh, subscriptions you can then have to access, uh, have full access to, uh, have access to advisory service in addition or um, to um, pre-configured best practices, practices such as standard identity management processes, um, RFIs and other um, types of content we are building. So there's a number of services we have and the basic, so the initial access to some part of the um, related research is available through the select access, it's sort of a trial type of access, and then there's a number of subscriptions. Hope that answers the question. So I think we are gone, uh, done with all the questions. So um, thank you to all of the attendees for listening to this Coupon Call webinar. Thank you, Jason, for your presentation and all the um, information you provided uh, in response to the various questions. And hope to see you all in one of our upcoming webinars or at the European Identity and Cloud Conference in May. Thank you.